On this week's Carrier Wrap, we'll look at some of the latest news across the carrier space, as well as talk with Bill Ho, Principal Analyst at 556 Ventures, about Verizon's latest results and the industry's trends away from unlimited data plans. Hello, welcome to this week's Carrier Wrap. It's the, uh, our first actual uh, Carrier Wrap uh, show. So thanks for joining us this week. Uh, I'm your host, Dan Meyer, Editor-in-Chief here at RCR Wireless News. And joining me this week from our, our, our home offices down in Austin, Texas, is uh, Sean Kenny. Hey, Sean, thanks for, uh, for joining us this week. We appreciate it. Hey, Dan, I, thanks for inviting me, man. I'm looking forward to uh, talking carriers with you. It's always exciting. It's carriers, right? It's always the big stuff. So uh, we definitely appreciate your time there. So yeah, so let's start off with uh, some of the big news from the past week. Obviously today, uh, or this week, I should say, uh, Verizon uh, announced its uh, quarterly results, uh, third quarter results. Uh, and and for, for Verizon, again, they've been very consistent over the past, uh, it seems like, several years with their results. Again, nothing earth shattering, uh, perhaps uh, nothing high or low. But again, you know, they announced, I think, 1.2 million net additions, uh, direct net additions, which uh, was down from last year and probably down a bit from what some of its rivals are going to post. But again, pretty strong numbers. Again, they're very reliant on their, on their postpaid uh, customer base. Uh, tablets made up a big part of their growth, uh, so that's always a, a big part of their uh, of their uh, kind of their, their numbers, uh, and those are always always very consistent numbers for them, and uh, very high value numbers also for them. So uh, good to see that from them. I know I was talking with an analyst uh, Bill Ho earlier, and we'll have his interview a little bit later. Uh, but he had mentioned that one of the surprises he saw was just the uh, the solid churn numbers from from Verizon as well. Their churn came in at less than one percent, which uh, again a very low number. Uh, some analysts were expecting it to be a little bit higher than that. But it just shows that Verizon's been very consistent on the marketplace, not losing really any customers to its rivals. Uh, and so, again, a very consistent uh, quarter from Verizon. Uh, financials for them looked really strong. Uh, they're very big on their financials. They like to always show very consistent numbers to their, to their investors. So, uh, overall, it seemed like a very good, uh, solid number, uh, a quarter for, for Verizon uh, in, in Q3. Again, we'll see some numbers from uh, AT&T later this week. Uh, as well as Sprint coming up, I think, next week as well. So we'll see how they look in the, in the big picture of things. But again, a uh, big quarter there from, from Verizon. I don't know, Sean, if you had any insight, what you thought from Verizon's number this week? Well, yeah, you know, like you said, there weren't a lot of surprises in there. And, and really, the word is consistency with Verizon. They've been just, uh, you know, very uh, systematic in keeping those slow sort of growth strategy. And I guess what I start to wonder about, and you know, full disclosure, I'm a longtime Verizon wireless customer, and I don't have any complaints about the, the coverage or capacity. I'm okay with the price point. I like my data plan, but uh, some of these newer sort of more innovative services like Wi-Fi calling, I would get a huge amount of benefit for that, but it's not available to me at Verizon. Uh, and this is speculation, but I assume just an operator that large, it's challenging to roll out a new service, but, uh, I just get curious at what point their sheer size will uh, start to affect their ability to be competitive and to match the service offerings that uh, some of the other carriers are able to put into the field quickly. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, I think uh, AT&T recently rolled out their Wi-Fi calling. So between them and T-Mobile and Sprint all offering it, you're right. At some point, Verizon will have to get on board with that, it seems, at least from a marketing perspective, if, if anything else. Well, and another uh, example of it that is top of mind for me is Samsung Pay. You know, this was something that got launched in North America amid a great amount of fanfare. And you saw three carriers that were in the mix from the launch. And then you saw Verizon that's working on a software patch that may or may not be coming out in the next few weeks. And I just, uh, you know, agility is a huge buzz <laughs> in the service provider space. So a, I would you know, like to see maybe a little bit more agility from Verizon from a customer perspective. Oh, sure. Yeah, they're definitely not known as the most agile carrier out there. They, have, they obviously are not a leader when it comes to a lot of these new services. Uh, I mean, they do have that new, that new Go90 video service, which is, is, is interesting, at least. Uh, you know, we'll see how well that plays out longer term. I mean, a lot of these things have been tried in the past, and I'm not really caught on with consumers. Uh, but it does seem like they're putting some marketing effort behind that and some dollars behind it. So that's one area where maybe they are trying to get out in front of others, but uh, but you're right. In general, they have been very slow to kind of meet a lot of these new uh, new service offerings out there. So yeah, that's that's a good point for them. I mean, again, they are like you kind of said, they're systematic, they're very conservative. Uh, they don't uh, jump on the newest trends all the time, uh, but when they do stuff, they try to do it right. Um, for the most part, I mean, I know years ago when the whole App Store thing came out, uh, they they launched their own App Store, and they had a big press conference about it. I remember attending it and. We were all sitting there thinking, you know, this, this makes no sense. Why they've been trying to get into this app store business, and they were really excited about it. And 
two years later, they shut it down. And, you know, obviously, maybe they're still smarting from uh, maybe some of their past experiences there with trying to roll stuff out. But, uh, but yeah, it, it'll be interesting what they, what they do when it comes to some of these new services, because uh, that is consumers like yourself uh, and myself, you know, we're all wireless consumers. We like to see some of these new services come out there. And, you know, maybe they're not targeted to all of us, but we'd like to at least see a, a carrier being aggressive and trying to launch new things. I mean, T-Mobile, Sprint, AT&T, even, they're, they're, they're out there pretty rapidly uh, putting new, new services out there, which keeps it on top of mind for people, too. Yeah, and Dan, what's the outlook? When are we going to get the rest of the quarterly reports from Sprint, T-Mobile, and uh, AT&T? So AT&T is later this week. Uh, I think uh, Sprint, I believe, is a week or two from now, and then T-Mobile, I believe, is the same time frame. So a few more weeks. I think AT&T and T-Mobile have already announced uh, kind of some subscri- sub- subscriber numbers to this point. I think T-Mobile announced uh, 2.1 million net ads, uh, which is uh, pretty pretty strong. I think AT&T said they would have 2 million net ads. Uh, Sprint has been uh, a little vague with their numbers. They're obviously going through their own issues. Uh, what they've put out there has been taken uh, on different sides by different people. I mean, uh, the financial community, uh, those who are, are, are pro-Sprint to take whatever Sprint seems to say with a, a very positive uh, uh, lean to it. Those who are a little more anti-Sprint, perhaps uh, look at the bad side of what Sprint's been saying. But uh, Sprint will be the most interesting, I think, because they are going through a lot of challenges, as we all know, uh, to kind of see what, what happens with them. But uh, we'll see what happens there. But uh, well, I guess maybe that leads a bit into kind of what Sprint's been up to over the past couple of weeks. I mean, obviously, uh, they've had some more uh, uh, t- uh, changes at the top of their executive branches. Uh, they've had some uh, changes to their limited data plans recently as well. I don't know if you've obviously, Sean, you've been covering some of that as well. And if you've seen some insight there and what you've seen from, from Sprint recently. Yeah, Sprint's uh, kicked in a throttling program for their unlimited customers. Uh, it's either 22 or 23 gigs. Yeah, 23 gigs, yeah. Point. Okay, once you reach that threshold, uh, you're going to see some throttling. And uh, basically, uh, I forget the specific terminology, but if you're in a busy network environment like a big city, your data use is going to get uh, deprioritized over other traffic. So you'll definitely see a speed decrease, which, I mean, Granted, unlimited data customers are a small portion of their customer base. That's not going to make any friends doing that to people. Sure. And uh, it, I obviously question the technical necessity of it because it's it is what it is, and it, it I yeah. think it's the capacity to provide unlimited data. But with Sprint, you know, they they're at this position where they've lost ground to T-Mobile significantly. SoftBank is increasing their investment in Sprint. And at the same time, they're about to undertake a massively expensive network improvement plan that they still haven't really defined. But all the speculation talks about, you know, 50,000 plus small cells, which is, yeah. uh, you know, maybe 30,000 to 50,000 a pop, depending on the complexity of the municipal laws and your fiber access and stuff. So, I mean, they're really at a, uh, a turning point. And I, I don't really know how to interpret this loss of their executive that's in charge of strategy and development it's not going to help anything but i don't know if it's symptomatic of larger internal problems or or what exactly the deal is but i mean bottom line right now is sprint is hemorrhaging money and losing ground to t-mobile so they're they're you know going in the wrong way on both of those measures and you just have to wonder at what point does softbank sort of put a hard stop to their investment and try to figure out another direction, but we'll, we'll see. I mean, Marcelo Clare has been a, uh, he's been a standout chief executive, I think. And, uh, he seems to be pulling the right levers in terms of how he relates to the organization, like what he did, uh, getting rid of his uh, bonuses and trading those off for sprint stock. So if the company's making money, he's making money. That's not looking like it was a great idea at the moment. Well, luckily about- he's a, like, he's already a billionaire. So, uh, but uh, yeah, he's got more money, but. Yeah, but I mean, he's a he's definitely a good brand ambassador. I'd say we saw him up at Super Mobility uh, show at CTIA, and I mean, he puts on a great public face for the company. But at the end of the day, they've got to wow their customers, and they've got to improve that network. So yeah, we'll see what the appetite is from uh, from SoftBank to to continue to bolster that. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, obviously, Sprint from a news uh, angle. Is a great company. Uh, they they obviously provide lots of uh, great uh, copy for us to, to cover. But you're right from an operational's point of view. That's they have been. You know, I mean, their network issues. They've been doing these network things for years. I mean, back to the network vision program, uh, to their you know initial Sprint Spark program, which is the 2.5 spectrum, to now the small cells and what they're going to do now. I mean, it's just been a continuous network uh, upgrade program for them. And it does seem like it's at least maybe starting to show some progress. I mean, they're getting better results in some of the root metrics. 
on numbers and some other things as well. So perhaps it's, it's, it's sh- trying to show some, some return there, but you're right. I mean, obviously at some point SoftBank is going to want to have uh, uh, start, you know, start seeing some return on their investment. I mean, they are increasing their, their, their control over Sprint, which I, one person I talked to last week about that was saying that, you know, at some point, you know, SoftBank's increased control over Sprint will at some point make it easier for them if they wanted to sell Sprint, uh, right. because they would have more control, it'd be easier to do it. But you know, that's down the road, probably not really, you know, no one really knows what the, what the plans are, but, but yeah, I think you're right. It's going to be interesting to kind of see how that plays out. And obviously, yeah, the management change is there. Uh, it seems like if you were a executive back when Dan Hesse was in charge, uh, you're probably a little nervous uh, just in general, because there's been a lot of turnover uh, at the C-level uh, executives and just a lot of VPs there. So um, interesting to see how that plays out for them. And, you know, and I wanted to ask you, Dan, about T-Mobile. I know you use uh, T-Mobile's network, and, and I, I'm kind of expecting when we get their quarterlies to see them widen that gap in terms of postpaid between uh, themselves and Sprint. But I guess what I'm getting curious about with T-Mobile is, is you know, and I'll grant that they're making network improvements in a lot of the big metros and stuff, but uh, is are they coasting off of just really, really good marketing right now? They, well, they are definitely great marketers. Uh, I will give them credit. Uh, their CEO is obviously, as we all know, uh, out there all the time, and they've got a lot of momentum. Uh, I mean, but their network guys are, I mean, some people I've talked to in the industry at vendors and at, at analysts, I mean, their network guys are top-notch guys. I mean, so they, they've been doing a great job with their network. Uh, they've rapidly turned around what was at, at a point, but it's basically a, a stale network. I mean, when the AT&T deal was going on, uh, when AT&T was trying to buy T-Mobile, there was about a, a year period there where T-Mobile did absolutely nothing to its network. And so it just kind of sat there. Uh, but since then, they have really turned it around. I mean, when you look at what they've done uh, over the past three to four years compared to what Sprint's done, um, I mean, T-Mobile has done major improvements for the network. Now, I'm out in Colorado, and there are, you know, we're a lot of rural areas out here, and so there are definitely areas where T-Mobile coverage still is not great, but, uh, but they're, they're turning it around. They're definitely doing a pretty good job. So, you know, I wouldn't say that they're coasting per se, but they've definitely built up, I think, a lot of brand equity mm-hmm. consumers, uh, which, you know, perhaps they could be coasting a bit. I mean, obviously, they're going to at some point want to start seeing more financial return, and so they might have to start cutting back on some of their network investments at some point. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, they're, they're, they've, they've been interesting to watch and they've done a pretty good job at, uh, kind of getting things turned around. That's, that's, that's for sure. Yeah. And you know, and one thing I will say about T-Mobile, uh, in, in comparing them and contrasting them to their, their competition, you know, this is a consumer focused brand. When you look at an AT&T or a Verizon, they have so many different investment strategies going around R and D for 5g networks, around internet of things, around connected car and by and large, T-Mobile, they're not spending anywhere near the same money in any of these spaces. It's almost like they're kind of, uh, uh, you know, reemphasizing their core business and then letting all this go on in the background. Yeah. But that said, while they don't seem to actively go through the same level of R&D and investment, they're very quick to roll out new services like their uh, their RCS support, which went out not too long ago. And, and so, I mean, they, they seem to really be able to walk a fine line between a, a focused strategy and a, just a huge emphasis on customer experience, which is paying off. Yeah, that's a great point. No, I mean, I, it, there's been some concern that perhaps they aren't focused enough on these other markets because, again, they, like you said, they aren't doing a lot when it comes to IoT and uh, connected cars and things like that, at least, at least you know, as much as everybody else is doing. So there's some concern that perhaps they're not looking at the long-term picture as much as other carriers are. But yeah, you're right. I mean, they are, when it comes to the, the bread and butter of the market, which is a smartphone consumer, uh, they are nailing that hard. I mean, they are just on top of that and, and you know, getting customers left and right. So you're right. That's, and that's been kind of shown in, the, in their numbers too. Yeah, and I guess the the context just occurred to me. We discussed Sprint as a unit of SoftBank, um, and and T-Mobile's a unit of of Deutsche Telekom. So while T-Mobile might not be engaging in all of these forward-leaning activities, DT definitely is. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So yeah, it might be. Yeah, you're right. It it could be. It could be a lot easier for them if if they wanted to have a jump on the IoT space to kind of leverage what DT's already done uh, and just start doing it. So yeah, that's a good point. Right. I mean, for obviously for Verizon and AT and T, they're kind of their their big company, so they have to do everything themselves, but you're right, for, for Timo, where they could at some point leverage that expertise from, from DT and, and, and kind of move in those spaces. But, you know, with, with T-Mobile, there's always a question about ownership stake and what they're going to do long-term too. So that's, that's always fun to cover as well. So, uh, well, hey, uh, any, any other insight you have for, for, for what you've seen this week in the, in the, in the carrier space there, Sean? No, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing what Bill Ho has to say. He's always got a, a lot of industry insight. What are you guys talking about today? 
Yeah, so it was great. Yeah, I talked to Bill a little bit ago. So we talked a bit about the Verizon results. So uh, you'll hear from Bill getting, getting his insight there. And also about the uh, about the Sprint and kind of, the, I guess, the move in general from the industry uh, somewhat away from the unlimited data or at least de-emphasizing uh, unlimited data for, for consumers. So we talked a bit about that. So so yeah, let's talk. Uh, let's uh, show that video now of uh, me and Bill Hill talking about some of those topics. Let's go to that, uh, that video now. All right, hey, thanks for joining us, Bill. We definitely appreciate you taking the time today. So obviously, uh, Verizon announced results this week, which uh, uh, we wrote up here on RCR. But uh, again, a kind of a, I guess, a continuation of Verizon's, it seems to me at least, their, their, their previous results. I mean, obviously, they're a very uh, conservative company. They don't do anything too crazy out there. Their results are very, I don't want to say kind of boring, but uh, they do have a very consistent, it seems, uh, consistency to their, to their results. What was your, I guess, general view, initial takeaway from, from the results uh, for, the, for the third quarter? Um, the I think the, the tablets is probably the more consistent, right? So they had a lot more uh, net ads associated with tablets. Um, their uh, what was nice shot that that uh, CFO Shamo said is that our net ads do not include any IoT. Or <laughs> um, so that, that begs the question of, well, why don't you throw that up? But you know. Uh, yes. So the phone ads uh, were, 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 I guess, okay um, in light of the, the competitive environment. Yeah. Uh, churn was down, which was, I think, uh, a lot of uh, Wall Streeters uh, were expecting it to go uh, at 1%, but yeah. it stayed at below that, the 0.93. Yeah. So that, that says that, uh, and they, they said in the remarks that they are working on retaining. So you know, it, it's about profitability. It's mm -hmm. not about customer acquisition. Uh, and, and they're very, very proud of their prime base. So if, if the prime base is pretty much tapped out, and so you don't want, there's really no money to spend to acquire prime customers, either at, you know, the, the prime customers at Sprint or, or uh, AT&T. They've been doing that for many years, so it's not yeah. worth the money to do that. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting point. I mean, obviously, on the tablet part, because that, is a, that was uh, a, a, the uh, main driver for their, for their post net ads, uh, but it also seemed like on the financial side, it's still continuing to drag a bit on their average revenue per account, I guess, that they use for their, their accounting. Because it seems like those results keep going, have, have kind of consistently been going down uh, while the number of uh, connections per account goes up, which, which would seem to me, when I look at the numbers, is that they're adding, you know, perhaps they're so adding, adding, they're yeah, adding you know, some awesome. tablets uh, on there, but the tablets obviously have a lower uh, uh, monthly uh, rate than a, a smartphone. So, that, so it's impacting their, uh, their, their revenue that way. Right. Yeah, so the the tablets. If you re, people recall that they had uh, many many quarters of one million do, uh, one million tablet ads. Yeah. But at the same time, he made he mentioned that uh, it's, it's ten percent uh, of the base and it's underpenetrated. So they've got a lot more sure. to go. So I think from from the standpoint of uh, ARPA, I think is what yeah. you're getting to is that it'll it'll eventually I guess creep up. Yeah. as as uh, time goes on. So you, if you add more in, in the base, then, then it logically would go to up. And another uh, factor in the ARPA calculation as well as ARPU is the uh, the service revenue is gonna go down. And it's a function across the industry of adopting this EIP model, right? So if you go unsubsidized plans, the service revenues go down. You've seen it across the board in every, every carrier, yeah. the T-Mobile, uh, I guess, warning it from the financial consequence when they started it off and then it'll level off and, and increase. And, you know, it, the question is, is it made up by, uh, from our part basis, uh, by the, uh, the EIP uh, equipment revenues? Yeah. Yeah. And it showed, I it showed in the results because their, their revenues, uh, equipment revenues year over year were up substantially. So definitely that part of it is you're right. Maybe it's not making up quite as much yet, but, but it does seem like you're right. At some point that will be the, the driver for that to, to kind of turn around those, those numbers. Again, you're giving up some of the monthly, service revenues for the, the customer paying 20 bucks or whatever extra month for, uh, for the device. Yeah, and, and I think that, I don't know if the number was serving you correct, that it's, it's less than 25% of the base on EIP plans. Yeah, it's very low so, percentage, yeah, yeah. So uh, I, th I think that, that they've got a long way to go. They, they've got, um, anybody who wants to upgrade, it's gonna be on the EIP plan. Uh, so, um, and then the, 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 he says something about securitizing it. So yeah. that's, that's a big thing about the EIP plans is basically securitizing and it's selling off, right? Yeah. And, and so given the uh, high value and high prime base that Verizon has, it probably is, is a good deal for those banks who want to buy that.
Yeah, and, and again, and he did mention too that they were going to kind of they had a very they're, they're staying away basically from the uh, the leasing programs. Obviously, T-Mobile, uh, Sprint are big on leasing stuff right now. It seems like Verizon is is not going that direction. They're going to they're going to stay with their normal installment plan as opposed to doing that, that leasing option. So, uh, and like I think Chemo had mentioned that uh, you know one of the issues with that obviously is you know trying to secure the the long term uh, return on, on those devices. And obviously, I think he had mentioned too in the comments that. You know, a lot of the times those refurb devices that come back in are being sent off to markets uh, overseas. But he, I think he had said that some of those markets are becoming more smartphone penetrated. So there's less of a market perhaps for those going, going forward. So uh, for, the, for the now, it seems like they're going to avoid, at least for now, the, the, the leasing option. So it seems. Right. So, so the, 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 the thing that he had probably in the, in the financial mind is the residuals yeah. for devices and probably specifically the iPhone. And so the residuals, uh, if you flood the market here and the, the, the target markets are already flooded, then the residuals in theory would be lower. And mm -hmm. so there's a risk there that, you know, conservative horizon doesn't like. But I think uh, also on, on, the, uh, on the leasing, on the competitive front, what was important that, that I saw was given all the attacks because Verizon's got the most postpaid um, base in the industry yeah. where specifically T-Mobile and uh, Sprint is going after them. And he basically says, we're not seeing any impact from the, the, the leasing product. And you can kind of say, okay, he's right because churn proves it out. Yeah. You know, it just, it, it went, it was pretty good. Yeah. And, um, if it was impactful, then, then it would be a higher churn, which, you know, the street was expecting maybe at 1%. Yeah, that's a good idea because I know T-Mobile, they've been pretty vocal in the fact that, you know, they always like to say what their porting ratios are. And uh, and it always seems like Verizon has always been uh, the low at the low end of the porting ratio. Obviously, Sprint was a big part of it, at t But Verizon was never a huge uh, porting net porter for them. And so, yeah, it does seem like you're right. Verizon has been able to, uh, you know, stay above a lot of this uh, noise going on. I mean, obviously, they've got some perhaps network quality uh, you know, accolades that perhaps are helping their customers are, are kind of aware of that. So maybe that's part of it as well. But yeah, it does seem like Verizon has been somewhat insulated more than their rivals in, in kind of that, uh, that, that churn aspect. And they, like you said, the, the churn numbers uh, bore that out this, this quarter too. Yeah, there's, I think that there's also a couple of things else to, to put up. And, and that is they, they lost their feature. They, they lost a good number of their feature phone base. Yeah. Right. So, so you, you lose them, but that's okay, I guess, in the sense that they were, they weren't, prime customers anyway. Yep. Yep. Um, what's also interesting and, and maybe distressing if I were the prepaid guy, guys at, uh, at Verizon is the three quarters of losses. So I, I tallied about 394,000 uh, losses in, in 15 alone. That's, that's not a small number. And so where are they going? Are they going to T-Mobile? Are they going to straight talk? Are they going to cricket? So, so that, that's kind of an unknown, but I mean, the trend is, is not a good trend for Verizon prepaid, even though, They've only, they're only 6% of, of, of the whole subscriber base, but you know, 394,000 is not something to sneeze at. Yeah, they've, they've, they just haven't really gotten, I mean, they've, they've adjusted their plans here and there, but they've never really seemed to have kind of nailed down that prepaid uh, customer. I mean, it just seems like, you know, again, the, the rates are, are fairly competitive, uh, not, obviously not industry leading, but they're, you know, they're not, not bad. Uh, but yeah, they just can't seem to really nail down that, that prepaid market. I mean, maybe they're relying more on their resellers, which again, they don't announce the numbers for the wholesalers. They don't announce IoT stuff. So you don't really know what's happening there. I mean, you see some numbers from uh, TrackPhone and people like that who are some of their resale partners. Uh, but yeah, but it's hard to tell what's happening there if they're, if they're just reliant on, hey, you know, you know, we don't, it's low value. We don't care too much about it or what, you know, what their, what their view is on. on well, he's also, I think, mentioned in passing that some of them have, uh, because Postpaid pricing and prepaid pricing have kind of normalized such yeah. that maybe some of the prepaid people are going to postpay, but I don't exactly buy that. Yeah, I mean, that's an argument that T-Mobile's brought up too, is that, you know, they, they've, I think they've claimed that they've also had seen some of their prepaid customers move to postpaid as well. But yeah, it's hard to, you know, again, those are numbers that you can't, unless you see all the numbers, which you're never going to see. Uh, I'm sure there, there's some of it. I don't know if that, that's kind of the overall trend. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure they're not lying to us uh, straight out, but you never know exactly what the numbers are saying. So, uh, but yeah, that's, that's an interesting number. You're right, because they are continuing to struggle on that, on that prepaid side. No, but again, there's still, you know, you know a, a huge customer base, a big, solid postpaid base, uh, high value customers. So, you know, revenues are always up there and it seems to be kind of what their main focus has been over the past several years is, you know, keeping the, the investment side happy. I mean, they spent a lot of money recently when they had to buy out the Vodafone stake. So, 
you know, that, that had a big impact on their, on their financial overall picture. So uh, it does seem like they're trying to stabilize their financials and kind of push away from, from that as well. Yeah, talk about financials. It was interesting in his, um, in uh, Shamo's the explanation of Lowell McAdams' quite uh, reported uh, plateauing of revenue in after 16. Yeah. And uh, so, so, I mean, I, I don't want to go into all, all the rest, but he, he, he lays out a very logical explanation of why, you know, with the sale of um, the, the, the wireline assets, the, um, the, the plateauing and, and decline of service revenue as a result of adopting heavily EIP yeah. um, and, and, and AOL's uh, startup on, on Go90 and advertising and things like that. Um, all that impact, obviously, revenue and, and profitability, and, and it was a good. It was a good explanation. Uh, I'm not a financial guy, but I, I work, I, you know, it seemed to make sense. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the numbers. Yeah, you know, I know the financial guys get big excited about all the EBITDA and OBITDA numbers and things like that. So, but uh, yeah, it, just, it seemed to make sense what he was saying. But uh, uh, but yeah, I guess we'll kind of see how, how that moves forward. But uh, but maybe enough about Verizon's uh, overall results there for the for the quarter. Uh, another thing I want to talk to you a little bit about was uh, recently uh, Sprint had announced that they were going to start uh, throttling or deprioritizing, whatever you want to say, uh, some of their unlimited customers when they re reach a certain threshold. So uh, the threshold was 23 gigabytes. So basically what happens is if an unlimited, current unlimited customer uh, uses more than 23 gigabytes per month of service on their smartphone, which is a lot of service, but once they get to that threshold, uh, if they happen to then be on a site that is seeing a lot of congestion, that that customer will be deprioritized and could perhaps see slower speeds. And so, uh, you know, again, that's, it kind of seems like it's part of a trend that's going across the industry, uh, trying to push customers away perhaps from the unlimited plans uh, to an extent. But, but I guess as you look at kind of that move by Sprint and kind of in general what's happened with, with a lot of carriers, I mean, I guess is the unlimited uh, customer becoming the, uh, uh, a dying breed perhaps in the, uh, in, in, the, in the market? Obviously, it seems like carriers are trying to, trying to move that way at least, trying to get people more on, on tiered plans or at least control the unlimited usage. Yeah, so, so I think from the limited standpoint in the industry, there's only really two, two two national players that, that offer it, right? It's just Sprint and T-Mobile. T-Mobile was at 80 and Sprint's at 70. Yeah. They, they increased to 10. They had the, the every opportunity to. They telegraphed it many months ahead and they did it. So, yeah. um, and, and then another one is unlimited isn't forever. So it, I think this is a phase step in kind of limiting uh, or capping uh, data uh, threshold capping. Yeah. And you now I think you observed that, that 23, 22 seems to be the magic number, right? Yeah. So with AT&T saying that uh, we're giving people 22 as a result of the, maybe the lawsuit. Yeah. Um, and uh, T-Mobile is kind of saying the same thing and Sprint magically come in 23. So uh, from, from that standpoint, that's kind of the, the, the industry data cap yeah. uh, for it. And, and then from the pricing aspect of it, they try and monetize it, right? So Sprint raised T-Mobile's, I think T-Mobile raised a little bit a while ago. Yeah, well, yeah. Verizon imp impact uh, close to home. Verizon impact uh, said you can keep it, but we're going to boost it up to 20. So that's kind of a negative stick that Verizon has yeah. to kind of move, move people off of that. And, you know, uh, in contrast to AT&T, who's kind of saying, hey, we'll give everybody a customer choice. The, the, the worry, I guess, if I were an AT&T customer with Unlimited is that, you know, with the industry following the industry, would they also in turn uh, add 20 to their unlimited plans as well and kind of move them? But, you know, in a, in a, in a conversation with, with um, David Christopher, I had it when I went to an at t analyst conference, I asked him about the at t approach in, he says, you know, we're all things to all people. Uh, as long as they, they, they don't abuse it, we kind of leave them alone, which is, you know, for the most part true. They could be higher ARPU um, users, um, from our our PA users, yeah. we want to use that term. Yeah. So the the account could be higher than just the thirty dollar unlimited. You could have multiple family members on that unlimited. So if they bring in over two hundred dollars in ARPA, then why monkey around with that? Yeah, that's interesting. Take away in that conversation with them. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I guess yeah, when I looked at it, I mean, obviously, you know, the, the raising of the prices on it. Um, you know, I guess from a, a strictly consumer's point of view, I could see why people are getting in an uproar about it because, you know, they think they signed up for a certain plan for a certain dollar amount. I know with the Verizon, for instance, I mean, you know, they stopped offering Unlimited a long time ago. And so all those customers who were on Unlimited plans were obviously off contract or off the two-year by this point. And so, you know, raising the price at that point, you know, traditionally carriers have not 
monkeyed with pricing. Once you know, once you're off contract, you pretty much were able to stay on that pricing rate, at the price plan, and whatever for as long as you stayed on that plan. Uh, you know, but it does seem like you know the, the industry trend is to kind of start like you know, raise the prices a little bit, and you know, I could see where consumers were a bit in an uproar that you know, hey, why are you raising my prices on this? But it, but it doesn't seem like that they are um, going against any sort of regulations and doing that. I mean, obviously, you know, the net neutrality stuff and the stuff that, that ATT got in trouble for, uh, you know, that was a, probably a, a different, more of a throttling issue as opposed to a pricing thing. And so it does seem like carriers were saying, hey, if I can't, if I might get in trouble for throttling, um, maybe the pricing is the way to kind of then start migrating customers away. Because I, I think in the Verizon case, uh, them doing that, you know, again, there was a lot of people still on Unlimited, so I don't think they're too concerned about a, a huge defection. But, you know, they're saying, hey, if you guys want to stay on this, that's fine, but we're going to start charging you more money and we can at least monetize it. Like, like you said, too, they at least monetize that service. And so that's kind of, you know, I think initially I was kind of like, yeah, that's maybe a risky move, but you know, it's probably not a huge risk for these guys. Again, it's not a lot of customers still on those plans and uh, at least on the Verizon side. So maybe not. Yeah, bad. I think also you have to, as, as a carrier, uh, you have to worry about the, 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 the bad actors, right? So yeah. Uh, I think in uh, John Saw's blog in at Sprint, he, he talked about three percent of the um, uh, of the the postpay base unlimited users probably. Yeah. In what eight, over eighty five percent of the network resources. Yeah. So uh, I think every every carrier has those three percenters. Yeah. And <laughs> manage it. Uh, so yeah. you know it, it's it's try and manage it so that they don't take capacity away from others. Yeah. That's yeah, I guess I always thought, you know, what can't they just, you know, hit the stick on those 3% as opposed to impacting the broader range of it. But again, you know, again, I know it's a, it's a huge uh, challenge for these operators to manage that usage on their data networks. Uh, I guess you can look at it one way. Hey, these carriers are still making, you know, Verizon wireless still made like 20, uh, $18 billion in revenue or, or profit uh, for the quarter. So they're not like they're hurting or anything like that, but obviously they have an answer to, to wall street. So, uh, that makes it a bit of a challenge for him. But uh, yeah, it's interesting to kind of see how the market has adjusted to uh, this unlimited uh, uh, data plans and trying to, you know, wean people off of, of those options. Again, interesting what AT&T is doing. I mean, again, they're not, you know, they're, they're trying to stay within the law. Obviously, they have that lawsuit, which kind of is probably adjusting what they're trying to do, but uh, or impacting what they want to do. But uh, it's definitely seemed interesting what everybody's, everybody's at least trying to work their way through this, this process, at least. Yeah, I guess from the PR positioning, right? That's if they, they follow Verizon and they have this, um, th this negative PR on, on that lawsuit, yeah. they go and raise raise a twenty to file Verizon. What 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 implication from a PR standpoint will that be? I'm sure they're in all in their rights to do so, but at the same time, you have to understand the negative brand consequences. Yeah, I mean, do you think for Sprint, obviously going back to what Sprint did you know, this past week, I mean, do you think that their move to kind of doing this could impact their uh, you know their their PR in, in the mind of people? I mean, obviously. You know, again, they are still, they still offer unlimited. I mean, people can still use quite a bit of data on the network, but it does seem to end, you know, kind of as from a, uh, a PR perspective, maybe it's, it's a bit of a, a bad mark for them. Um, and especially as you're going into the holiday season, um, do you think this will have any sort of impact on, on their growth going, going forward in any, or do you think? I, I guess uh, it's, it's the, the grandfather people versus the new customers who want unlimited. Yeah. Right? So from, from the price standpoint, they're still the cheapest so, in the town. Yeah. Um, the, the only thing that's limited is kind of the network, yeah. right? So the network isn't fully baked out in 2.5 to 2x carry aggregation where you get the speed, whereas T-Mobile in certain markets have that uh, a wide contiguous band to present a, a good speed experience. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, from, from that standpoint, if you're on, you want limited, it's just only two, two, two places to go. Yeah, and if you were price sensitive, then you probably go to Sprint, knowing that. And if you were tech savvy, you know they're building out the network, and that in the long run, that's the place that you should stay at. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting one. I mean, obviously, Sprint's network issue—that's been a, such an ongoing uh, issue for them. And I know they've always talked about the fact that because of their spectrum depth, that they could offer you know superior services and they could support unlimited for longer periods of time. But uh, I, know, I remember Dan Hesse was even talking you know, back when he was CEO. I mean, you know. Uh, as part of Unlimited, he said, you know, Unlimited is not going to be forever. Uh, at right. some point, we're going to have to have to have to move on that. And obviously, that's happened here uh, more recently. But uh, but yeah, and, and that's always been kind of their their ace in the hole was their spectrum depth. 
but even it seems like from them that they, you know, they even they have some sort of you know limit on what they can do in terms of uh, supporting these this unlimited use. So I think it goes down to the business case and profitability for the unlimited, right? Yeah. So I mean, in theory, you can throw as much spectrum as it, but you know, from the capex standpoint, what's your rate of return? What's your rate of investment? Is really it comes down to dollars and cents in in, in offering that 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 as a service. Yeah, and for Sprint, I mean, dollars and cents is a huge part of their uh, issues right now. So I know their their ownership wants to start seeing some money come back in. So yeah, I think for them, you're right. That's probably for them. They want to need to start seeing some turnaround there in terms of financials. I mean, maybe obviously you want to see some growth in the care and the customer growth as well too. But I think uh, for them, perhaps just some sort of financial uh, return might be a, a good. Yeah, that 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 earnings call would be is 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 going to be interesting. Yes, I think we're all looking forward to that one. Obviously, you know, the AT&T one is coming up as well, and T-Mobile, uh, those are always fun too. But yeah, I think I think Sprint is always um, looked at by most as kind of the most interesting uh, to kind of see what their plans are because it does seem like they've uh, uh, been stuck in a rut for a while, and it's always interesting to get kind of their. I think they've been, they've they've given enough information to 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 either. If you were pro Sprint, the the information would be, hey, they're doing. I get it. If you were negative anti Sprint, it'd be, oh, they're being vague again. <laughs> Yeah, either short them or, or whatever the case may be. That's um, a good point. You're right. I mean, whenever you look at the financial uh, analysts on it, the ones who, you know, whose companies perhaps hold shares in Sprint uh, are obviously a little more positive on what they're trying to do. Uh, it does seem like the ones who perhaps aren't uh, do have a different a different view on it. So, yeah, it's kind of hard to read through, between the lines on what, what people's views are on, on Sprint. Because you're right, they are putting out information that can be taken either way. I mean, really, you don't know what's going to happen there. Yeah, so I mean, go back, going back to unlimited, right? So they're capping it. So if, if I were saying, good, the limiting cost is another cost containment mechanism. Uh, the, the, the $10 is, is another way of monetizing unlimited, right? Where you hadn't been before. So, you know, it goes back to where um, I think, remember Dan Hesse increased the activation fee? Yep. Or something like that by, yep. by 10 bucks. And he says, you know, that, that was that impacted the bottom line quite a bit. So, you know, a $10 increase, people aren't going to leave because, you know, they're the cheapest game in, in town for unlimited. So it, it's in essence a captive audience unless the person is just totally upset and just want to depart. Yeah. And I guess maybe Sprint's getting confident enough in their network improvements that they aren't, you know, maybe people aren't at their wits end or like, you know, customers aren't like, hey, you know, I swear if they raise my pricing, I'm going to leave because that works so bad. I mean, if their network is getting better, uh, they get a little more comfortable, a little more confident that they can you know, make that price increase and not see a huge defection. So, uh, yeah, maybe they're getting to a point where they get more comfortable. At that point, it, it's really tough understanding uh, individual buying psychology or switching psychology, right? I mean, everybody's pretty yeah. much different unless you're an enterprise, and so it gives you a really good deal. I hey, just want to mention uh, one thing about uh, in in the news that came up that was interesting that I, I caught was. Um, how I think the industry is talking about Verizon getting off the two-year contracts and yeah. subsidized phones, right? Yeah. They're talking about the percentage of EIP, and then and then the CFO says, except in our enterprise base, where majority of them do not pay for the phones outright, and they want the uh, they want the subsidized pricing. So they're still offering then the subsidized pricing to the enterprise base at least. Yeah. 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 I think if you look at the transcripts, I, I thought that was pretty interesting. And in, you know, again, in the context of our subsidized phones going away, if they have a huge enterprise base, that's, that's, that's tough. Uh, and you know, enterprise base is, is typically high value and less price sensitive than consumers. Sure, yeah, well, that could be, I mean, part of the reason why, again, like you said, like you were saying earlier, the fact that their EIP base is still fairly low, uh, again, that could be one of those numbers that never get to be, you know, much above 50% just because if the enterprise base is continuing to want subsidized phones and they have a pretty good size subsidized base, uh, enterprise base, yeah, that could be one of those challenges for them to ever, ever get that up to high. That's interesting that, that the enterprises are still looking at that as, as you know, uh, they're kind of sticking to the old model, I guess, you know, again, maybe paying a little bit more each month for their, for their service, but, uh, but getting that subsidy up front, maybe that works better for their financials for the, for the enterprise, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, see how they kind of how they how they kind of uh, work through those different uh, different industry industry segments there. Uh, interesting part there, but but I, I do agree though. Going back to Verizon too, I wish they would include their uh, uh, their wholesale and their IoT numbers because it makes it hard to uh, compare them with anybody else out there because they don't say what they're doing. And you yeah, know, I think that uh, it, out there. It, it, from the, the 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 overall standpoint talks about that they're all the total net ads, but I think. Um, they, they break it out 
I think T-Mobile breaks it out. I think Sprint breaks it out. I don't yeah. know if I see wholesale breakout from uh, from Verizon. Yeah, they really don't. They just kind of they really only focus on their own retail stuff, and that's kind of what they do. So well, I mean, maybe it's in their yeah. I mean, maybe if you dig into their ten Ks, maybe your their eight ten Qs or whatever, maybe you can see it somewhere in there. Um, maybe more in there, but yeah, they don't really talk much about that, and they kind of downplay it. So uh, it is interesting. Their view on that, but hey, that's Verizon. They've got they seem to be uh, always going on their own little path. They don't really seem to worry too much for the most part about what everybody else is doing. I mean, they do make some changes here and there, but uh, they always do seem to be kind of on a, on a different path than everybody else. So uh, uh, that's yeah, great. I think, uh, again, the, I mean, the, the takeaway from Verizon earnings is that they're doing well, better than a lot of people expected for third, third quarter. Yeah. Given a very, very t- tough competitive environment. Yeah. And they set up pretty well for Q4 for the fourth quarter. Obviously, the, the holidays is always a big part. And I'm sure we'll talk uh, about that as well once we get to that, that part as well. But uh, that's how it's going. Hey, Bill, we definitely appreciate the time today. Uh, great to see the Star Wars figure in the background there. Good job there. Uh, yeah. but, again, <laughs> but again, thanks for taking the time to speak with us today on this. And uh, hopefully, well, hopefully we'll talk again soon on, on the topic too. But thanks again. Okay. All right. Great. Well, hey, thanks everyone for watching this week's show. Appreciate you ch- uh, ch- checking out on the first, uh, the first episode. And uh, make sure to check us out again next week.